My name is Jerry Gill. Today is November 15, 2010. I'm visiting with John Linehan here on the Oklahoma State University campus in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This interview is uh, for the Old State Storage Project of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. John, appreciate you coming in today. And sorry about the problems with parking from the get-go. Uh, John, uh, you've had a highly successful professional career. I mean, and you don't have to say that. I'll say it for you, okay? And uh, you may, but you you maintain close contacts with the university. I want to visit with you about those two factors. But first of all, could we back up and talk about your early life, about where you grew up, and your sure. parents? I was uh, the second of eight children, reared in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. My mother was a housewife, homemaker. My father was a pipe lighter, worked in the field all his life. Mm -hmm. Finished high school there in Bartlesville in 1957. Uh, no one else in my family. I was the second oldest. My oldest brother at that time was in the military. He had gone to uh, school up in Kansas for a year and then went in the military. So nobody else in my family. My mother and father were both high school graduates, but had not gone to college. I came to Stillwater and uh, uh, I guess I was pretty naive. I thought you came to school at the university and you went four years, you graduated, and then you went to work. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me that you would be at a, at a university for more than four years. I, mean, I knew a little bit later you could do some graduate work, but I never got on my radar screen. So I came here and uh, freshman year, I pledged a fraternity, uh, was a houseboy, and then the uh, bowling alley up north of town, Frontier Lanes opened in 1958, and I worked there for three years and worked as a houseboy to get through college. John, do you mind, if you back up, I want to ask you a couple of questions, but did, where did you say you grew up in? Bartlesville. Bartlesville, yeah. okay. And uh, did, did you have part-time jobs as a kid growing up? Oh, always. There's, always. What, what kind? There was eight kids, you always had a job. <laughs> right. I used to, uh, or at least I remember really a paying job. I was probably nine years old, and we, uh, kids in the neighborhood, we uh, sold newspapers on the street corner of Bartlesville. You don't find many newsboys anymore, but uh, we sold newspapers. And if you could do that for a couple of years, you could graduate to, if you're 11 or 12, somewhere in there, you could get a paper route. And I did that, and then uh, I think I was about 14, and I went to work for the theaters. At that time, there were three downtown theaters. And uh, I worked in one of the theaters, took tickets, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Honey, so you had, there was eight kids, you had how many brothers and sisters? Where did you fit well, there? I was second oldest, okay. and there was, uh, we're all still living. There's uh, six boys and two girls. John, could you share some of your school and community activities that you were involved in as a kid? Oh, there wasn't a whole lot of activities. Mm -hmm. My activity was primarily was work, mm -hmm. so uh, probably pretty much limited uh, a lot of activities. Mm -hmm. You know, played ball in junior high, but it was obvious that uh, there was not going to be an athletic scholarship. <laughs> So uh, somewhere around the ninth grade, eighth grade, uh, came to the conclusion that if I was going to go to college, I was going to have to pay for it. Uh, and I was not going to make get a, 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 any type of a scholastic scholarship. I don't even think there was that many scholarships back then. I don't remember, but I don't think so. Um, I know when I came to school, it came through fraternity rush that I remember that uh, a couple of the houses asked me about a grade point. What's your grade point? And I told them I had a 3-9. Mm -hmm. um, they found out after the first semester that that 3-9 that might be a little bogus. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, it was a true statement. I did have a 3-9 mm -hmm. out of high school. But Bartlesville was on a five-point system, not a four-point system. And so, but you know, you don't have to tell everything you know. They never asked me about whether it was a five point or a four point. They assumed it was a four point. But I did make my grades. And uh, John, what, uh, what, 
There's some values, uh, some uh, principles that you learn from your parents in growing up that uh, help contribute to your success later in life. Oh, it was probably a work ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want something, you're going to work for it. Uh, certainly, there were not a whole lot of things to be given. As I said, my father worked in the field. I, I have no idea how uh, my parents could raise, how, could, how they could rear eight children in a, we never, my parents never owned real estate, never owned a home, always a rent house. And we lived in the same rent house for, I guess they lived there over 30 years. But uh, it was a work ethic more than anything. You want it, you're going to have to work for it. What year did you graduate from high school? 1957. 57 and entered school that fall. Yeah. What, uh, what, what influence you enrolled at Oklahoma State University? Uh, it was, there was probably, the only consideration would have been OU or OSU. Mm -hmm. And OSU uh, was probably more closely associated with my background. What, uh, see, at that time, it was in 1957, is that when we changed the name from Yeah, it was Oklahoma changed. I think Oklahoma it was that State? change, that 57 went from A&M to Oklahoma State, yeah. What did you think about that change? Did you like oh, it? Oh, kind of? it probably didn't affect me, um, probably only because it had always been A&M. Mm. I would probably be more of a traditionalist, mm. but in looking back, it was a good move, you know. It, it certainly was... Uh, Probably a little bit, a better accepted at being Oklahoma State University as opposed to Oklahoma A&M. You know, there was uh, A&M like any other schools. It's, with A&M, it's uh, considered an agricultural school, whereas Oklahoma State University, and even A&M wasn't necessarily an agricultural. I mean, it was an agricultural school, but but there were other colleges, other schools within the within the university. John, what, uh, had, you, had you been on campus before you enrolled? I mean, no. What, what, was, what, no. what was your first impression of OSU and the campus? Oh, I came in that summer. They had some orientation or something. A couple, mm -hmm. three of us drove over from Bartlesville. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we ever left the Student Union. I, mean, I don't think I even saw the rest of the campus. I don't remember. Uh, was there some influence in you, other than was anybody that encouraged you to go to OSU, anybody you knew no. that went to OSU, you just no. decided that's kind of yeah, what you need to yeah, go? nobody that, as I say, my family, there was nobody in the family that had gone to college, so that was never an issue. Uh, some friends of mine came to school here, uh, so it was just seemed rather logical. So your, your major was accounting from the get-go? Yeah, no, I was in the School of Arts and Science the first year, undeclared, did not have a major. And I think it was probably my sophomore year that I switched from Arts and Science, a bunch of general courses, to uh, to the business school. So did, did, did you then at that time decide on a career in accounting when you switched over to business? No, I had no idea, probably didn't even know what an accounting graduate did. Uh, I uh, got into school, took the basic courses, um, seemed to, I don't know, seemed to be relatively, not necessarily easy, but it was more probably um, compatible with my thought process. Any, any background for your interest in that, where did it come from? You no. didn't know anybody or talk to anybody no. about accounting? Was, it, was Will Anderson head of the School of Accounting at that time? No, he did not come here. I think he might have come about 1960. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't even tell you today. I, I probably could recall my advisor. I think, his, I think he taught a tax course, Harrison. I don't ever recall meeting with him. Mm -hmm. uh, no. I took the, the courses and I was always busy and uh, working, and so there was never really a relationship between me and the scholastic advisor. Um, I do recall, because I 
think I took the basic courses my sophomore year, my junior year would have been other accounting courses in the intermediate accounting and then advanced theory. And uh, Gene Shower. Gene Shower, right? Shower. How do you spell that? S C H R E R, as I recall. Okay. Gene Shower was a professor. Okay. Uh, you remember some other professors or classes that, that, that you recall? Oh, no. I think Dick Heath who is here in Stillwater, who's a neighbor of mine now, taught the oddity course, but he was an adjunct professor. He had a practice downtown and just filled in. And so I, I had auditing from him, but, but Shower was the one. I probably had two or three courses from him. And, and um, I told the story at, at some function here when I was speaking about um, Mr. Shower. Uh, I said his name was Gene. I don't think I knew his name was Gene for a long time. I mean, he was Mr. Shower and a fabulous uh, instructor. Um, I left here uh, undergraduate in 61, and went in the military, and then we'll get into that work after that. But um, I came back, uh, came from Los Angeles. I've been with Getty Oil. But came here in 85, and somewhere after that, I was over here on campus for a business school function, and, and I was speaking to a group, and uh, Mr. Shower was there, and I had the, had the opportunity to meet with him for a few minutes before that. And I told the group, I said, it was amazing, because when I was in school and Mr. Shower was the uh, instructor, but I would have sworn he was six foot four. At least six foot four. I mean, he was a giant of a man. And I said, today, either I've grown or he shrunk because we're eyeball to eyeball now. And I haven't grown that much. It was just my perception and how I remembered him. Uh, fabulous individual. I mean, and, and with him, it was. Well, for example, in his class, we, uh, there was a certain way to do things. Uh, the way you fold your paper, what you put on your paper. And there was no cutting up in the class. I can never remember anybody ever raising Cain in his class. It just never happened. Um, I mean, that's the command that he had. Just fabulous command of the, of the classroom. Where, where were most of your classes held at that time? Moore Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of them were there. More uh, some of the classroom building, mm -hmm. but mainly you know the psychology and sociology and so forth were over in the classroom building. But the business courses would have been over in Moore Hall. So John, you said you again. I'm sorry. You pledged uh, what fraternity? Oh, I pledged Kappa Sigma. Kappa Sigma, uh, mm -hmm. and, so and you, probably you, you, did you live in the Kappa Sigma house? Yeah, you know, lived there four years, four years, all four years. Probably uh, that was probably one of the more um, turning points with me as far as uh, as academics. Mm -hmm. Certainly, as a freshman, I was required to study. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that you either do can or do if you want to or not do it. I mean, we were required. We had study hall every night from 8 to 10, except Friday and Saturday, and then Sunday afternoon we had uh, study hall. And uh, so, as freshman pledges, uh, certainly that was uh, um, a big factor in my academics. That and probably we working at the bowling alley. Uh, I worked at the Boeing. I ran the front desk there for three years. It was that one of the student unions at off no, campus? No, no, this was Frontier, Frontier Lanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leagues, they have leagues every night. The league would start, some at 6.30, some at 8.30, but once the 8.30 league started, they took all the alleys. And so, I, although it was noisy, it was an opportunity for me to study. So I could study noise didn't particularly bother me, but I could study there, and, and that was probably a, a big help for me. There's some other jobs you have where you're a student? I was a houseboy. Mm 
houseboy at the Kappa House, houseboy at the Kappa Sig House. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of describe what you did as a houseboy? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, some of the things that uh, I tell people now at various functions or dinner parties or whatever about, uh, you know, you serve from the left, you take away from the right. And, and some of the things that, from a houseboy standpoint. And the other thing you do, you never stack dishes. And people look at me like, you know, having a, a dinner party or something, and people will then get up and carry plates to the kitchen area or something. And I always tell them, you, know, you never stack. If you stack, you got to wash both sides. And as a houseboy, you know, we, we served, but we also did all the cleaning. You had to wash all the silverware and wash the dishes and put them away and all that sort of thing. But, so it was, a, it was again, a, a learning experience. Um, I don't know, a little etiquette there where you Well, there's a great deal of etiquette, but etiquette really started at, with the, at the fraternity house, with mm -hmm. the house mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was at every meal, mm -hmm. and, uh, and periodically, uh, you know, you had to sit with the house mother. And she <laughs> had classes on etiquette for all the freshmen when we came in. I mean, there's a lot of us didn't know the difference between a dinner fork and a salad fork. I mean, it just never, probably just never got on our radar screen. But she explained it to us. And never even knew about dinner, thought it was supper, didn't you? Well, supper, yeah. <laughs> you know. I, I guess I came from the environment that would say, my mother would say with a house full of kids like that, did you get enough to eat? My mother never asked about the presentation of the meal. Some people would ask, but what a wonderful presentation. Well, that never got, <laughs> it was never discussed in our household. Yeah. Now, what, what do you remember about the campus at that time? There's particular buildings, uh, the landscaping, what do you recall? You know, I don't remember a lot. Uh, I, I was talking with my wife the other day. We were, I don't know how it came up, but I was talking about, because Capsig House at that time was probably the, well, the Pike House was on beyond the Capsig House. But it was the farthest west of campus. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, a lot of sorority houses have all built down to the west, and, mm -hmm. to the west and to the south. Mm -hmm. But I don't really remember walking through the snow or mm -hmm. through this rain. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we walked. Uh, there weren't very many, you know, people didn't have many cars. Mm -hmm. So we did an awful lot of walking, but uh, uh, you know, I just don't remember anything specific uh, about the campus per se. It was always cutting across. I spent a lot of time in the library during the day between classes. I would be at the library. Did you have some favorite hangouts on campus at that time, student hangouts? Oh, well, the student union probably would have been one, but there wasn't anything uh, from my... On the fifth floor of the year, and the big eight room Starlight Terrace, was that where they yeah, were? Yeah, that was. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't remember any you know, specific places. I mean, I just don't remember the places there. How about off campus? Well, off campus, there was a number of places. You know, out north of town, there was Deeks, and there was uh, the Oasis up on uh, Knobloch, and um, there were some places. But Louis was out on probably on Perkins Road. Or, Spabs. Yeah, but I think Spabs and, and Deeks was the same, wasn't it? Might, might have been. I think it was Deke uh, Overholt that had that place up, up north of town. But wasn't Louis on, uh, maybe it was on Main or Sooner, somewhere out that area, but it's, the stuff's all gone. Did you did you attend sporting events at that time? Yeah. yeah. What, what do you remember about sports teams in that area? I, I remember, what I really remember about the sporting events, and, and back then wrestling was a big deal. But uh, I guess if I had to recall one specific thing, it was going to football games. I mean, we went to all the football games, and, and we all wore coat and tie to wow. football games. I mean, it was just, I mean, you dressed to go. I mean, you didn't see, matter of fact, even going to class, uh, from a fraternity standpoint, uh, as I told somebody one day, there was three things that we couldn't do, and one was we couldn't ride a bicycle to class, couldn't carry a briefcase, and we couldn't wear jeans. And and now you look today, and it has been that way for a long time. So, so what, help help me with the first two. I understand maybe the jeans being too in, you know, informal, yeah. but what, what's the briefcase? Oh, I think the, the bicycle and the 
in the briefcase had to do with being a little nerdy. Yeah, it wasn't cool. Yeah, it wasn't cool at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that, at that time, was there a dress code in the library that you recall? You know, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but I do remember coming to the library and um, spending a lot of time in the library. I used to come to the library and used to go down to the basement. And I think it was what the grad students had these little cubicle type, I wouldn't even a cubicle, little inlets where they could study. And mm -hmm. I used to go down there because it was quiet. And uh, I'd find one. I'd study there. That's great. Do you have, you know, looking back, John, do you have some favorite student memories of your time at OSU? Oh, sure. Um, I think that, uh, well, certainly the, the the one memory that would stick out was that uh, my senior year, uh, we were building a float. I don't think we had many house decorations back then. I think we were mainly floats. And we were doing a float with the, um, with the Cap Deltas. They eventually built the house next door to the Cap Sig house, but it was just under construction when I, I think they might have moved in that house the year after I graduated. But we were building the float and you're plucking this paper through the chicken wire and I was uh, underneath, inside, doing something uh, underneath the float and some girls were out there punching paper through. And I don't know how the conversation got started and one of them, she and I were talking and and it was a it was fall, you know, homecoming it was probably in November, and it was kind of cool. And, and uh, I said, "Did you want to go out and and get coffee or hot chocolate or something?" And she said, uh, "Well, I came here with one of your fraternity brothers." And I said, "Well, fine, invite him. He can go with us." And that was my wife, who I uh -huh. so we met in. Uh, November of our senior year and married the following summer. So OSU homecoming has a special memory. Well, memory the homecoming, the fraternity, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, she, uh, we laugh about it now because uh, we knew each other about six months, eight months before we got married. Mm -hmm. And uh, next July it'll be 50 years. Yeah. So for whatever reason, it's uh, We've been together 50 years. It is a special memory, I'm sure. Well, it is. Uh, as I say, there was the two things that, uh, and, and both of them uh, tie between the fraternity and, and the university. Uh, certainly meeting my wife here and the fraternity requiring that I study. And probably without that, uh, that discipline, I don't know what I would have done mm -hmm. if I had not been in the fraternity with Larry. Because I probably, well, I don't know. Uh, I may have, but was I would motivated enough? Was there enough discipline for me to study? Maybe. But did it was you, certainly helpful. Did you participate in any student, student organizations or activities at that time? Oh, yeah. We, we were required to. Mm -hmm. and, and I was. Uh, Matter of fact, uh, I don't know how we got onto this subject because that was you know, uh, 1956, which would have been an election year. And I don't know, my, and I was in the League of Young Democrats. And my wife at that time was a Republicans. And uh, after we uh, met, Oh, a couple weeks later, I was somewhere and I saw a little 80 inch high ceramic donkey. And so I rode on the donkey about glad to see that she had joined the, Rep the Democratic Party and yada yada and sent it to her over uh, her. Uh, the Kappa Delta house, as I say, was under construction, so they lived in Hanner Hall, so I sent it over there. And, and about four or five days later, I got to the Cap Sig house. I got the same thing, except it was a, an elephant. And uh, that's when we, uh, we started dating and so forth. 
But it was a league there. It was also the Student Union Activity Board. And were you were you a member of the board? Yeah. Student Union Activity Board. Mm -hmm. What what were some of the things that y'all did at that time? You remember? I don't know. Something. I don't remember you know, exactly what we did, but I was a you know, it was a Student Union Activity Board. I was participated with. I don't even remember some of the other organizations. But then again, you know, starting my sophomore year, um, uh, I worked. So if I wasn't, you know, working in the kitchen, uh, I was working out the bowling alley. So there wasn't a whole lot of time. And studying. And studying. But it was, uh, because as I say, you know, my parents uh, never had the finances to provide any assistance while I was in school. And did you pay most of your way through school with paid your jobs? You know, so you, you, you came out of school with any debt then you paid I don't even think we had debt then. I mean, I, I wouldn't even known where to go to to secure a loan. Mm -hmm. It just didn't seem to, uh, I don't know that any of the people that I associated with had student loans. It was just very, if it was there, it was not very prominent. What were you doing in the summers to help make money? I was a house painter, Bartersville. Okay. Yeah, I you painted houses. Just external paint. Okay. It didn't make any difference. Yeah. I put it on. <laughs> I could do it inside, outside. It didn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. Were you working with somebody else, or were you just independent? Independent. So how did you qualify to be a painter? Oh, I don't know. It just <laughs> just hung up your yeah, shingle. And it wasn't a very difficult thing to do. There was a guy there in Bartersville had a construction company, and. Uh, um, he'd have a house to paint, and he was a big-time construction guy, you know, remodels and all that stuff, siding on houses, and and he had crews, uh, but he'd have a house, and uh, he knew what he had to pay his crew to do it, and, and I was always cheaper, because I would work from, you know, 7 in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. I was not there by the hour, I was there on the, to do the job. And so uh, he provided the paint, he provided the brushes. I just did the labor. And uh, for him, it was a good deal because I was a whole lot cheaper than his his painters. And he could also, he knew what his cost was going in, oh, too, didn't he? he? I mean, uh, he was an interesting guy. Good guy. Um, he had three daughters, all older than me. Probably always wanted a son, but I'd be working. I worked every day except Sunday. Heck, I would have worked Sunday, except uh, I probably would have been shunned for, for doing it on Sunday, but I worked every day. And he used to come out wherever I was working on Saturday afternoon and say, well, why don't we um, go fly? Because he had his plane and he was a pilot. And so I'd go out and fly with him. And, uh, or would go up to uh, Hula Reservoir up north of Bartersville and water ski. Wow. And, uh, Pretty cool. Yeah, it was great. It's just the two of us, and, and he was a, as I say, he never had any boys, and, and he was a, pretty concerned about drowning, I guess, because, and then it was rather competitive because I was just a kid, and, and we never wore jackets, life jackets. We wore belts, mm -hmm. but he would wear a jacket, and he'd wear a belt. Uh, he probably looked smarter than the rest of us. But the competition would be, you know, who was staying out there the longest. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't want to. When I was pulling him, he didn't want to quit mm -hmm. too quick mm -hmm. because that would mean that, you know, he wasn't physically fit or something. And so he would stay out too long. And then we didn't have ladders. You know, you'd crawl over the side of the boat. And I'd have to pull him in. And I used to tell him, now, Mr. Brown, You've got to take the vest off. I can't get you over the side because he was just dead weight. Mm. No, no, he wasn't going to take that <laughs> vest off. I, maybe he thought I was going to push him under or something. But we used to go through that. It was always it was fun. So I spent the summers as a house painter. Um, but I, I had to have a job. And saving you money for school. Go to school. Expenses. Yeah. Mm. And you know we didn't make much money. I was at the bowling alley. I made a dollar an hour. I mean, I was happy to get a dollar an hour. It was great. Never, you know, you didn't complain about that. You get a dollar an hour, it's pretty good pay. So what, what year did you graduate? Finished undergraduate here in 1961. Okay. 
Did you, in 61, I understand you, you said earlier about you had a military career. Yeah. Did you go into the military directly yeah, after right you away. graduated? Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Well, I was not going in. You know, at that time, Oklahoma State being a land-grant college, you had to have two years of ROTC. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I enrolled, the only thing available was Army. Those kids that knew what they were doing got in the Air Force. I was in Army ROTC and for two years. And we had these old, horrible looking old brown uniforms or World War II or maybe before that. And uh, so at the end of my, and, and it was never, ROTC was never particularly difficult for me. You know, a lot of it was, to me, pretty um, elementary. Uh, and so I made good grades in ROTC. And so at the end of my sophomore year, there was a, the cadre, uh, the ROC, ROTC cadre, both Air Force and the Army, they had bowling leagues. And one of them, the Army, that one of the leagues, there was a Master Sergeant Terrebone, little guy, New Jersey, New York guy. And he came to Bowling Alley. Um, uh, it was before must have been in the late the spring of my sophomore year. And he told me, he said, I, I see you have not signed up for advanced ROTC the next two years. And I said, oh, Sergeant Terrebonne, I, I've got some other courses. I, I was just giving him a bunch of excuses. I didn't like those uniforms. I didn't like any of that stuff. And so I said, uh, I've got other courses I want to take. And, and he knew I didn't have any money. And so he said, well, you know we pay 90 cents a day to be in, in advanced ROTC. I said, sign me up, because on a 30-day month, I got $27. Great, 31-day month, $27.90. And that money was supposed to be there to uh, keep your uniforms clean. I would tell you, my uniform never found its way to the cleaners. I mean, I needed the 90 cents a day just to get through school. Now, you have to go back then and, you know, a dollar an hour and all of that stuff, but my tuition was $84 a semester. It was $6 a semester hour, not to exceed $84 a semester. Yours was probably very similar. That we didn't have, um, you're gonna take 20 hours, take 20 hours, but you're still gonna pay $84 for the semester. So um, that's how I got into advanced ROTC. So then you got commissioned when you graduated well, I went to summer camp between my junior and senior year and down at Fort Hood, Texas. And um, then I came in my senior year and about my, uh, sometime in the spring of my senior year, because I knew I had to go in, but, but back up, my senior year, I applied for and uh, I, I participated in the Army flight program. So my senior year, I flew here at Stillwater, out of the airport, flew an old Aronica stick on the floor, you know, no instrumentation. Uh, they had a bit of a compass and they had a, a float for a, a, your gas gauge, but there was no radio, there was nothing, no uh, instrumentation to speak of. I had an old wire throttle on the side and had 95 horsepower. Um, and that's what the Army had to fly, because you had to fly a conventional landing gear, not the, say, the Air Force, they all flew Cessnas, 150s, 172s, 182s, which had a tricycle landing gear up front. With the Army, you had to have a tail dragger, and they had these old Aronicas, and uh, I mean, there were times that, uh, at that time, the Stillwater Airport had 3,000 feet of runway, and on a really hot afternoon, you could run that Aronica down and it wasn't going to get up in the air. It just didn't have enough power, enough lift. The air was too hot, too thin. And uh, you just shut it down. Come back later when it's cooled off and get up. Did you, did, you, did, you down, did you actually start down the runway? Oh, if, yeah. you, if you didn't lift off at a certain time, you, you, you get the down there about, about 2,000 <laughs> feet and you're not getting up. You're not going to get up that day. So I flew in the Army flight program. And, and so I had committed then that I would be in for three years because I wanted to fly. Hmm. And so I uh, went through flight school here, did all of that, passed the, uh, my 
you know, I soloed in eight hours. Um, had my 40 hours I think I had to have to, um, and I took the course, so that was part of it. So I didn't have a written exam to get a, a, a private pilot's license. I had to just, somebody from the um, FAA came out and we had to take a check ride. And I took the check ride and passed, and so I had a, I had my private pilot's license. But um, I think it was in the spring that in my senior year, the professor of military science, I don't remember his name, but called me in his office. And he said, we're going to, as opposed to a reserve commission, uh, we're going to offer you a regular commission. People who got regular commissions either went through OCS or they went through West Point. I didn't know what a regular commission was. I said, well, what is that? What, what difference does it make? Well, he said, you're in for three years to fly. So if you take a regular commission at the end of three years, you just resign and you're out. Whereas a reserve commission, you know, that was a two-year obligation and you're out. But because I was in the flight program, I had a three-year obligation. Um, I said, okay, you know, why not? He said, if you ever want to stay in the Army, if you decide you want to stay in the Army, you should have a regular commission, not a reserve commission. Made sense. I still didn't know what it was. And I thanked him and tried and walked out of his office. And the secretary was a Mrs. Pye, P-Y-E. She bowled at the bowling alley. And she knew I didn't have any money. And she said, you know if you take that regular commission, you don't get $300 clothing allowance. I went back in his office. I said, I can't take a regular commission. Of course, he wanted to know why. I said, well, I understand I don't get the $300 clothing allowance when I go in the military. I said, unless you want me to show up uh, wherever I go in jeans. I said, I don't have the money to, to buy the, because with a regular commission, you had to buy your own uniforms. Uh, but for reserve, you, they were, were provided. So I uh, <clears throat> told him I couldn't take that. So he said, okay. So I left. And, about two weeks later, he called me in again in, in his office, and he had a big round conference table, and he had a map on it. And he said, where would you like to go in the military, your first assignment? Gosh, I looked around. I've never been anywhere. <laughs> Not been anywhere in my life. So the farthest thing, I, I guess if I'd have looked close, I'd have seen Fort Lewis, Washington. But I saw Fort Ord, California. And I thought, that'd be a great place to go. California. I've always heard about California. So I said, Fort Ord, California. He said, fine. He said, you'll go to Fort Ord, California. And he said, at Fort Ord, you'll relinquish your reserve commission, and you'll get a regular Army commission. But you'll already have your $300, already have your clothes. I said, OK. Sounded good to me. So when I graduated, I had orders for Fort Ord. And I had purchased my greens my TWs, fatigues, khakis, $300. It went a long way then. So I had all the uniforms that, that if you had gone through West Point, you would have been provided. If you went through OCS, they would have been provided. And that's the reason, I mean, that if you were regular Army, they just never caught up. The system had never caught up with every people who would get a regular commission who did not go through OCS or through West Point. So I left here, I guess in June, after, after graduation, and I drove to Fort Ord, California. And I showed up there, reported in that morning, 75,000 troops at Fort Ord. And I drove on the post. Wonder, Lord, it's June, middle of June. These people are in winter uniform. Now I'm in TWs, I'm in summer uniform. I was the only person there, 75,000 troops, and I'm the only one in summer uniform. I didn't know that Fort Ord was winter uniform year-round. It's on the peninsula, the Monterey Peninsula, and it's cool. They eventually shut Fort Ord down because of the meningitis. Cool and damp. So anyway, that's where I reported in and spent, uh, gave up my reserve commission what I do remember about the Reserve Commission was that the, my service number was 0541019918. Had to know your service number. And when I got a re regular Army, it was only six digits. 
092649. Um, so it was a little easier to remember your service number. But anyway, I, I went out there, I spent, I, I, I was there, and from there I went to Fort Sam and then back to Fort Ord and, and then the following year I was um, on orders. I always thought I was on my way to flight school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd always done everything I was supposed to do. You know, when I got to Fort Ord, got rid of the reserve commission, got the regular commission, and went over to what they, you know, the personnel group and uh, put my orders in, put in my papers in for flight school. Uh, two days later, they called me over there and said, you're not going to flight school. I said, well, I'm going to Mineral Wells. I, you know, I've already flown fixed wing. I want to fly rotary. I knew I was going to Mineral Wells. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, a regular Army officer cannot go to flight school until he has a year of troop duty. Uh, well, nobody told me that. Mm -hmm. So I spent another a year there, troop duty at the Infantry Training Center, and uh, the following, after I had my year of troop duty, regular commission, I was still second lieutenant, I put in for flight school. And, uh, you know, same story, three or four days later called me in, said, you're not going to flight school. I said, why not? Because you're on orders for Europe. And uh, you, Maybe you can get to flight school when you come back, but you're on orders for Europe. So I left there and went to Europe for three years. And uh, finished the three years, and during the three years I had been, you know, after 18 months, you, as a rule, you're promoted from second lieutenant to first lieutenant. So I think I hadn't been there very long in Europe and promoted first lieutenant, but then got promoted a little early. So when I came back after three years, I was captain. I came back and asked you, where, where were you, what base were you at in, in uh, Europe? I was in France. Mm -hmm. I was in um, three different posts in France. Mm -hmm. It was about the time we were getting kicked out of France by <coughs> the de Gaulle government. But it was all part of uh, NATO and uh, the, uh, the UN but it was in three different posts, all in the, um, never in a really large city, always out of a, mainly field type units. I started outside at Boussac, outside of uh, Bordeaux. Actually the town was St. Andre de Coupsac, and then spent a year there and then went over to uh, Quachapeau, and the town was La Rochelle on the uh, western coast of France. Worked with some Navy people there, it was a seaport. And then came into Angoulême, which is at, um, south of Poitiers, south of uh, pretty much the southern end of the Chinon Valley. Fortified city, you know, and a lot of cities in, in Europe, France, Germany were, you know, were fortified, going back to the Middle Ages, where it's much easier to defend the high ground than it is low ground. So. By the time I was leaving there, I was on orders to the 1st Armored Division at Fort Hood. And again, I thought I was just passing through there. I'm going to, to Mineral Wells or Fort Ruck or somewhere to fly. And uh, then I found out that you couldn't have, uh, you couldn't go to flight school. A regular Army captain cannot go to flight school. The only ones going to flight school were lieutenants and warrant officers. But a regular Army captain could not go to flight school. <coughs> <laughs> that was 1965, and so I said, this is crazy. So I resigned my commission. I thought that was all there was to it. You just resigned. Uh, I quit. Uh, what I found out was that you don't quit unless the Secretary of the Army um, agrees and signs your, uh, your resignation. And Stanley Reeser was Secretary of the Army. He didn't know me from Jack. But there was a, what the, uh, in the military, they, what they call endorsements. Your unit, I'd write a letter, and then it had to go to, say, to battalion, to division, to wherever. Uh, the, uh, everyone would put an endorsement on it. So to get to the Secretary of the Army, it had to have 11 endorsements. It had to go through 11 different offices to get to the Secretary of the Army. And every one of them would recommend disapproval. Nothing 
personal they'd say it's just we don't think regular army captains should get out of the military not at this time because we were just really getting into uh, Vietnam prior to that Vietnam was um, what they call MAG assignments military advisory assistance group and it was strictly voluntary so it was really in the mid to late 60s that they started sending troops into Vietnam uh, right after I got out. So anyway, I put my papers in. They kept saying no. And uh, so that went on for a year. And I was there at the 1st Armored Division. And every other Friday, I put my resignation in. <laughs> and I, there'd be 11 endorsements. Nothing else you're persistent. Well, it was just, you know, to me, and, and actually the, uh, the general grade officer was the deputy commanding general of the 1st Armored Division, and he had heard somewhere along the way that when I came in that I played a little tennis, and he was a tennis player, so he and I on late Friday afternoons would play tennis. And uh, I don't know, maybe two or three days a week. And if it happened to be a Friday, he would see my papers either coming in or going out. And he'd always say, you know, I recommend a disapproval because I don't think, you know, would like for you to stay in the Army. And he'd say nothing personal. And I would always say, you know, nothing personal, General, but I'm going to win again today. And so we had a, it was a laughing deal. I mean, it was a, I, I thoroughly enjoyed, I had no hassle with the military. I enjoyed it. I had a good time. But I just wanted to do some other stuff. So you finally got out. Well, finally, some officers at the Fort Monroe or Fort Lee, Virginia, took it to federal court on an involuntary servitude issue because the reserve officers were getting out. They couldn't stop them. They were getting out. Uh, there was no freeze on them. They were just trying to keep the regular Army officers in. And they went to federal court with it, and at the end, the Army just backed away, and, and we all got out. So I got out in uh, October of October of 1966. Yeah. Came to uh, Tulsa. Went to work for a subsidiary of Getty Oil, uh, Stelly Oil, mm -hmm. and so I was a little, you know, came into their training program. So I was a little older than. Uh, because the rest of them were just coming out, and I'd been out of out of uh, schools since uh, 1961. Here it is, the end of 1966, and I went to work there and uh, started there in October of '66, and started graduate school at Tulsa University in January of '67. Went to graduate MBA program there for the next three years, uh, six semesters. You know, could you go ahead and kind of summarize? You had a, a lengthy and, and, and a distinguished career in the petroleum energy uh, business. Can you kind of share some highlights of your your career briefly? Oh, I don't know. It was all that exciting or highlights or whatever. But I I went to work for uh, uh, Skelly, as I say, it was a Getty subsidiary. And I was there starting then in the in the fall of, of 66 and uh, I'd really been out of accounting or I, 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 was, out. I was never in accounting uh, although I had an undergraduate degree my major was accounting uh, but I started with Skelly and then really started more in the uh, what is now called information services. Back then it was called data processing. Mm -hmm. And I was writing programs and stuff like that. Uh, and going to graduate school at night. Uh, so when I finished graduate school, and I think it was in May of 70 that I actually got through graduation. I think I'd finished the courses in that first semester of uh, of the 69-70 um, school year would have been the sixth semester. Um, but then I graduated in May. And so between, after I finished graduate school in December, the academic part, 
I just started studying for the CPA exam. And uh, it was the following May when I graduated, I also took the CPA exam. And uh, I had to go back the following fall, I think it was August or something, and had to take uh, one course again, uh, one section of the exam and pass the CPA exam. Uh, so I had an MBA and a CPA and uh, was out of data processing and back over on the accounting side for Skelly. And I was then by 1975, no, it was early. Probably 73, 74, I became the assistant controller for Skelly Oil. And then in 75, I'm trying to get all the dates somewhere in there, it was pretty obvious that at some point in time Getty and Skelly would merge. And um, it was late 75, some people from Los Angeles, from Getty, came to me and asked me if I would come to Los Angeles. And uh, as assistant controller for Getty Oil, the parent company. And so in 76, early 76, February, I guess, I went to Los Angeles. And then, oh, maybe two years later, became, became the controller for Getty Oil. And uh, it was controller then until Getty was acquired by Texaco. That took place in uh, 84, and then uh, Texaco asked me to stay because uh, uh, there, was, well, there weren't any other officers left from, from Getty, all the rest of them were gone, asked me to stay, and so I stayed and said I would stay for a year. So I stayed for a year with Texaco in Los Angeles. Yet their offices were all in White Plains or Houston. And after the year, they, or close to the end of the year, I was pretty bored. There wasn't much going on out there. And uh, they said, would you stay another year? And I said, I, I cannot do that. I said, I don't have enough work right now to do. And uh, you, know, you know, we read the Wall Street so many times. Uh, with three hour time differential to White Plains, New York, uh, by afternoon, they're all gone. So I was ready to do something else. And they said, well, we had a position in Houston, but I said, you know, I, I did that. I did that 10 years ago. I'm just not interested in it. Texaco was a little different. Uh, dues paid somewhere else didn't count much at Texaco. I mean, they'd pay the wage. Lord, they'd pay great. But uh, the position, you know, you had to really have your longevity with gig. Texaco. So I came to Kermit in 1985. Did, did, did they come to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was a former CEO of, of Getty, Harold Berg, who had retired and was down at uh, Lake Austin or somewhere outside of Austin. And he ran across somebody that said Kermit was looking for a controller. And uh, so he suggested to Kermit that he come out to talk with me. And so they did. And I came to uh, Oklahoma City with Colonel McGee and uh, came there as controller and then the next year became chief financial officer. And uh, I enjoyed getting, getting was great. I didn't, you know, in Southern California was fine. You know, some people you know, joke about it that, you know, that you wouldn't go there because of the traffic, but you get used to anything. It's kind of like now, because living here in Stillwater and going to Oklahoma City, that was my commute in Los Angeles. When you went, uh, Kerr McGee was, was Frank Pearson. Frank CEO was there, yeah, time. I talked with Frank, that's who I mm -hmm. talked with. Mm -hmm. and came to work there and great part of it. super individual, great people. Frank was CEO, Jerry McKinney was, uh, uh, was a chief operating officer, president chief operating officer, and Tom McDaniel. Uh, Tom had uh, the law side in human resources, and then my responsibility was all of the finance and data information services and internal audit and treasury and tax. And so that's why I was split, split up. But we had a great working relationship, great people, thoroughly enjoyed it.
And what a responsibility as a major corporation with those kind of responsibilities. Did, did you have a, what kind of staff did you have working under you? Oh, you know, that's uh, how many in total? Maybe 600. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you had some. If you think about organization, uh, you know, you really you only have maybe five to eight people report to you. Right. More than that, you don't, you lose control. Mm -hmm. And if you have five or six, seven good people, really good people working with you, you know, you can take care of all that. And, and so I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, Kermagee was great to work with, uh, Getty was great to work with, uh, a little different philosophies, but still great companies, good people. So you, you with Kermagee until what, what year did you? I retired did, in uh, 2000. 2000, and, and again you started to work there in? 85. 85, so yeah. pretty. Yeah, pretty we good. had a, Frank retired in 97, and, and we started really in earnest looking at other companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't tell you how many we looked at. Uh, one of them was Anadarko, and but we looked at uh, just the gamut of companies approximately Kermagee's size. To, is that to, to merge with? To merge with, to acquire. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always had a social issues. Who was going to run the company? And so in 1998, we looked at uh, Oryx out of Dallas. They had been up and down. We looked at them and uh, I talked with some of the Oryx people and uh, informally and uh, Luke Corbett, who was the CEO of Kermagee, um, I made the pitch to the board, to the Kermagee board, in uh, probably August of uh, 1998 about Oryx, what a fit it would be if we could do it. They had North Sea operations, we had North Sea, they had Gulf of Mexico, we had Gulf of Mexico. They had onshore, we didn't have onshore. But it was a great fit, and so the board agreed, and Luke, uh, then talked with the CEO of Oryx, and I'll think of his name in a moment. And uh, Luke came back and said, well, it looks like maybe we, you know, we're going to have some more talks. And I said, well, because there was always an issue of uh, social issue, who's going to run the company type thing, I said, if you need to give up a job, give up mine because this is a great fit for Kermagee. And, uh, and they talked, and Luke came back maybe a week later and said, uh, we're going to go forward with it. And uh, their CFO is going to be the CFO of the uh, combined companies. I said, well, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean it. So that's fine. Well, that was in September. and. Uh, in uh, early October, we were going to New York to announce the uh, merger, 15th of October, thereabouts. Like on a Thursday, we were going to leave Oklahoma City on Wednesday. Uh, Monday night, or I think it was Monday night, uh, the Oryx people came up to Oklahoma City and uh, their CEO, CFO, their general counsel. But somewhere back there about that Monday before we were leaving on Wednesday to go to New York to announce the, the merger, um, their CFO came in my office, a fellow named Ed Moneypenny, and he said that uh, he wasn't coming to, uh, to Kermagee, to the combined companies, that he decided he was going to do something else. So I said to him, if you talked with Luke about it, if you talked with you know, your CEO about it, he said he had, and I said, well, you better do it. And about an hour later, Luke came in my office and asked me, he said, have you talked with Money Penny? And I said, yeah. Talked with him, he came in here over an hour ago. And uh, so we agreed because I think once, you know, you, you with me anyway, once you had made that decision, to retire, it's pretty much, you know, it's a mindset. 
And to me it was. I mean, I was already talking about what I was going to do in retirement and yada yada. And, you know, it was already done. So uh, Luke said, well, would you stay? And I said, I will stay a year during the transition to be sure the two companies get together and we iron out all the bugs and the systems and everything. So we agreed that I would stay a year. Well, then the following summer, still hadn't hired a new CFO. Then we got into early fall, and I'm, you know, I'm gone at the end of September. And so somewhere in there, maybe early September, late August, somewhere, Luke came and asked me, would you stay until at least, to stay until the end of October? And I said, well, yeah, Halloween, that's fine. <laughs> Appropriate. Yeah. And then so we got into October, and they still hadn't hired a CFO. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still thinking it's going to be somebody in-house that had been there and very, very well qualified. And uh, so by November, he's, would you stay through Thanksgiving? Well, Thanksgiving came and passed. And uh, I think it was after, but close to the end of November, I said, look, I will stay one more month, but that's all. I will stay through the end of the year. So I did, and he hired a CFO in, in December. So uh, I retired. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed my time at Kerr-McGee. I had the good fortune that I, in, like 86, when I became CFO, I had the office next to Mr. McGee. And he was a um, very, very interesting individual. He was in good, was not in good health. Mind was still working, but his body didn't get around very well. And I had the good fortune of having the office next to his, so I would see him, you know, a couple times a week I'd go in to see him. Although Frank was CEO, but Mr. McGee's name was still on the building, and, uh, and it was uh, delightful. Uh, there was things that you know we would talk about um, financially. That he was a geologist, very very bright individual. But there was things you know in the finance area that he really had never been exposed to. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm sure I learned a whole lot more than he did, but it was just, it was interesting to talk with him. I, I remember his birthday that first year I was next door to him, and uh, he had a, his, his administrative assistant with a, was a lady, and been with him for 40 plus years, Elizabeth Zorning. And uh, so that morning I came in, and he used to come in the office about nine in the morning, but uh, I would leave about six. He was always still there when I, was, when I left. And if I left at seven, he was still there. So I don't know how late he stayed. But uh, it was his birthday, and, and I stopped by somewhere the night before, and I got these balloons, these helium balloons that are on um, walking balloons. You probably have seen them. They have, um, legs on them that pop you know, up and down because of the folds of the, of the cardboard. But they were helium, and so you could walk them around the room, and they'd jump. And anyway, I got four or five of them. And uh, I took them in that morning. Oh, Elizabeth, she didn't know. <laughs> well, she thought I was kind of crazy anyway, just one of these crazy people from California. And she said, I, I, I don't think we should do that. And I said, oh, Elizabeth, he'll have a good time with them. I don't know. I said, Elizabeth, if it's something happens, you just tell him you were out of the office and I put him in there and you never saw him before. So Elizabeth and I, we got along great then. And uh, she came over that evening and uh, she said, you wouldn't believe it. She said, Mr. McGee played with those balloons all day long. <laughs> but he was a good head. Just, uh, and he did so much for Oklahoma City. I mean, without... McGee leading the way, and others, so Ed Julian and, and uh, Gaylord and so forth. But Mr. McGee was the one. Uh, the Myriad Gardens would not be there. I mean, he put his money in the Myriad Gardens. 
chances are the Cowboy Hall would not be there. It was on its way out of town, and he and several of the city fathers got together and put money in it and kept it there. But he did so much for Oklahoma City, uh, just unbelievable. You take some of the old, particularly not the employees per se, but widows of some of the older employees, you know, they tell you today, if, if Dean was still alive, Kerr McGee would be alive and well in downtown Oklahoma City. Probably would, but he's not alive. He died in 89. And, and uh, just a great individual. John, you've, uh, you were involved and have been involved in, in Oklahoma City, and you're there for many, many years in nonprofits and service yeah. organizations. Uh, can you share some of your experiences? Oh, when I gra after I retired, I had been on several boards locally before, nonprofits per se, um, like St. Anthony Hospital Foundation Board, the Myriad Gardens uh, Board, um, a number of those. Um, and I enjoyed that. And after I grad, after I retired, certainly, I spent time with them. The uh, later on, the uh, the audit committee for the uh, National Museum. Uh, Which museum is that, John? No, uh, for the uh, the National downtown the National Memorial. Oh. And. Uh, but I also went to, went on a couple of boards, oil company type boards, Tom Brown and then Pacific Energy, and eventually they were both sold. Did you have a special feeling for youth and young young kids? I noticed boys well, and girls I was on club. Well, starting in the mid-90s, 90 something, 96, 97, I went on the board of the uh, Boys and Girls Club. And, um, I chaired that board for a couple of years. We built a, a new facility there in 2000, and probably 2005, 2000, yeah, 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, built a new Boys and Girls Club there, 36th and Western. Uh, still stay somewhat associated with them. I'm out of town, so I'm not there much anymore. But, uh, yeah, my wife, has been involved with children's issues for a long, long time. She did a program and started a program in Southern California called Kids on the Block, where she would go in with another lady in the schools and, and they would talk with the kids, K through five, about at that time it was mainstreaming the handicap. So they'd have two puppets, and these puppets are wear size four clothing. I mean, they're 40 inches. 44 inches high, so they're not marionettes. These are actual big puppets. And they would dress in black and stand behind them and talk for the puppets. And one puppet would be able bodied, the other would have a spina bifida, overweight, hearing loss, blindness, you name it. They, they, all the different things you could think of where those children would be considered different. And it was trying to get the kids to understand and accept mainstreaming the handicap. She did that, and then when we came to Oklahoma City, she did the same program there, but by then it had changed because of the McMartin case out in Manhattan Beach, California, 1983, uh, in a daycare. There was kids that were sexually abused. So she uh, really focused on physical and sexual abuse of children. She'd been involved in that forever. Great program, uh, awareness, going into the schools, talking with kids. If she wrote a book, uh, if you didn't maintain your sense of humor, it would break your heart about what the kids had told her. Matter of fact, the last couple of years that she did it, if they didn't have a school counselor there, she wouldn't do the program. And if she did three programs in a week, before she left the school campus, two out of three, either the sheriff or the police would be there because some child told the counselor that they were being physically or sexually abused. 
I mean, it's, uh, I mean, you read about it now in the paper, but we're talking about something, you know, 10, 12 years ago, 14 years ago. Uh, you didn't see as much of it in the newspapers. Now, it's everyday occurrence. You see, you know, kids that are physically or sexually abused. So, anyway, I mean, was involved with that and, and uh, have always been, you know, a real joy to be around the kids. Well, another another passion of yours, John, through the years has been Oklahoma State University. You yeah. you've served for many years in the OSU Foundation, including one year as chairman of the board. Uh, what what year did you serve on, on the board? You know, I, when I came back in '85, back to Oklahoma from uh, California, because I never thought when when I was with Yeti Oil in Los Angeles, uh, because that company was owned by majority owned by two trusts. The Sarah Getty Trust was a Mr. Getty's mother and his trust. His mother's trust held 42, 43 percent of the stock of Getty Oil and he held 22 percent of the stock. So between the two of them they had about 65 percent of the stock. There was no way anybody could acquire Getty Oil. Yeah. It wasn't going to happen. So I never thought I'd really ever leave Southern California. Mm -hmm. Certainly not during my working career. Um, but as you know, back then, uh, when the price got right, and Mr. Getty was died in 76, and, and the trust, and then there was three people of the trust, and, and uh, one of them was, was Gordon Getty, the uh, youngest surviving son. And uh, another uh, director of the company, Lansing Hayes, an attorney out of out in New York, had a law firm there who was very close with Mr. Getty, and uh, Security Pacific Bank. But Security Pacific Bank never stood up as a trustee. They were named a trustee, but they didn't ever get involved because of some tax issues, and certainly Mr. Getty had a lot of tax issues, had some tax issues. And then Lansing Hayes died, and really the sole spokesman then was uh, Gordon Getty. And he spent a couple summers with us, uh, summer of 82 to summer of 83 in Los Angeles. He's a real different uh, musician, um, wrote music. Uh, he kind of fancied himself a mathematician. He was a pretty good mathematician. He was uh, kind of also maybe fancied himself a bit as the absent-minded professor. And, and he was a bit of that. But um, anyway, the company was sold. And Texaco acquired the company. And um, so then, as we said earlier, I came to Kerr McGee in Oklahoma City and never thought I would, but I did. And so somewhere after 85, uh, got involved with the university through the business school, through the School of Accounting, um, through the foundation, and, uh, and I guess with me it's always been the same. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about um, the fraternity by coming to school here and the fraternity requiring that I study and, and that sort of thing and then the university, of course, what the university gave me, I mean the university gave me a whole lot more than I could ever give back to the university. And so it became time then for both of us, both Caroline and I both were involved, uh, she through the College of Education and uh, so we became involved with the university. and it was. Oh, I don't want to say it was just a payback, but uh, it was more, I tell people at the foundation that uh, as we're raising funds for regardless of the campaign or regardless of what it is, that you can never say thank you enough. And I believe the same is true. I, I don't think you can. And, and so really the work I do with the university is more saying thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. because. Without the university, you know, hey, I met my wife here. I mean, you know, what would I be doing? Where would I be uh, if I hadn't been here? I was very fortunate. And uh, you know, in breaking those, you're kind of your service in a lot of areas, particularly in, in the business school and then with the foundation. What, do you remember the foundation? What when the time you were there? And see, what year were you chairman? Do you recall? Oh, probably late eighties. I, I remember. You know, there was a really a transition within the foundation. You remember when the foundation used to have offices over in the student union, and 
and um, catch as catch can, so to speak. But, but when I was CFO of Kerr McGee, uh, chair of the finance committee, chair of all of the, everything associated with finance, uh, we had a, a retirement plan. We had a defined benefit retirement plan for our employees. And we had a committee that really ran that, and it was dealt with, I it was involved certainly, and chaired it with the treasurer and three or four other people. All, actually, well, not everybody, but maybe 75% or 60% of all had finance type backgrounds. And uh, we had to manage the funds. Uh, smartest thing we ever did was in 1986 we hired some new fund managers. One of them was an individual named Alan Dworsky. His company was Mount Auburn and I could tell you all kinds of stories about that, but the bottom line was we gave him $30 million in 1986. Never touched a penny back from him, never took any away. And in 1997, 11 years later, that $30 million had grown to $450 million. That's why the Kermagee Retirement Plan was so well funded. Now we had other fund managers that also did well, but he was a premier fund manager. Um, so when I came over with, with, with uh, the foundation, I was obviously interested in how you invest your money. Well, it was all invested in fixed income, 100% fixed income. And I thought, you know, I've talked about, have you thought about, you know, diversifying, thought about getting into, oh, those are too risky. Uh, but we did. We changed and uh, it went from a, you know, a 100% fixed income to maybe 60, 40 equities to fixed and eventually got to there. But it was a big change for the university, a big change for the foundation that, uh, oh my God, you know, we didn't know if we could do this or not. But, but if you remember from the late 80s, probably starting in 90, 91, somewhere in there, to 97, there was a tremendous run on the equities. I mean, if, if you were in the equity market, you know, a, a blind monkey wearing gloves could make money in the equity market during that period of time. And uh, this individual, this Alan Dworsky, he was about a, a year, 18 months ahead of everybody on the, the biotech. And then he was about a year, two years ahead of everybody on dot-com. And so they, gosh, by 1997, we had it, um, at Kerr-McGee a retirement plan that if you just bought, technically speaking, it was the present value of the accumulated benefit obligation, which said, how much money would it take to buy an annuity, fixed annuity, for every employee and every retiree today? That's what it was. I mean, that's what you refer to as that present value, the accumulated benefit obligation. And we uh, we could have bought back in '97, done that for about round numbers, four hundred and fifty million dollars. But the value. The market value of the plan asset assets were over a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So we had what you know, we referred to as a 2.2 to 1 security ratio. So back then is when we decided that you know, we had a good run, so we would switch out of equities, partially out of equities. I mean, instead of being 75-25, we went to 50-50, saying, hey, if the stock market completely crashes, we still have enough to take care of all of our employees, all of our retirees. So it was a good time. And, and, and you know, if you think back about it, it was good for the foundation to get out of fixed income, right. get over into some equities, get some experience there, and hire some good people. And anyway, that was, uh, it was the early part of the time I was in the foundation. And uh, over the years, have been you know involved with the trustees and the governors and on the uh, audit committee, currently chair of the audit committee, recently chair of the investment committee, uh, still serve on the investment, you know, things that I enjoy doing. But but to me, it's uh, it's, it's not a something that I have to do. Right. To me, it's just part of the payback. 
it's uh, John looking back to your time your leadership what, what do you think is uh, what should be the primary mission of the foundation the OSU foundation well I think they have a stated mission and, and there's no disagreement there but I think you look at the foundation what, what are they there for well, they're certainly there to garner funds to manage those funds well and provide that funding to the university. I mean, that's their purpose. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, somewhere along the line that you, know, you have to, I mean, students today, um, round numbers, take a student, in-state student, what, $20,000. Where do you get $20,000 to go to school? Uh, how many people, you know, particularly if they have a number of children, you come up with twenty thousand dollars to go to a year, just one year, to a um, state institution. It's a lot of money, but that's what it cost. And when I realized, you know, I, you can't equate back when I was here. You can't equate my working for a dollar an hour. I mean, what the <laughs> hell? Uh, I could take, uh, you know, realistically. Theoretically, it, it was less than two thousand dollars. Probably closer to fifteen hundred dollars. Be really scraped by. You could get by, maybe somewhere between fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars when I was in school, and that was you know room, board, books, tuition, everything, spending money, whatever it took. Uh, but now, you know, it takes you at least two thousand twenty thousand dollars. So well, let's say that's a, uh, you know, a, a multiple of at least 10. And uh, I don't know how many jobs around here, you know, where kids are working as waiters or whatever they happen to be doing. I'm not sure they're all making, you know, 10 or $12 an hour. So um, it's, it's more difficult. And so I think with the foundation, to the extent the foundation can, can bring in funds, able to tell a good story. I, I always talk about if you're going to raise money somewhere, you have to have a compelling story. There are so many groups out there that, that need funding, and they're, they're, most all of them are good, but you really need to have that compelling story to somebody as to why uh, they should contribute. And I always say, well, you know, it's the compelling story, and the right person is telling it at the right time to an individual to, uh, to begin to you know, give back. John, what, uh, what were some of the, uh, I say some of the challenges during your period, and what were some of the, you think, some of the uh, successes of the Foundation during that period, uh, what would it be the late 80s, early 90s, and you were yeah. mid, mid 80s to early 90s, and you were really engaged? Oh, I think just the, you know, the philosophy, I think uh, part of it was the, I mean, you look back then at raising money um, was not nearly as um, size-wise of what we talk about today. I mean, back then, if you talk about trying to raise a billion dollars, it just probably just laughed. Uh, <laughs> I think the successes of the foundation have been the ability to to reach the people, the alumni, uh, friends of the university, to acquaint them with the university and, and tell them really what their money is going for. Um, Carolyn and I have a couple scholarships here out that we continue to, to uh, put money into. And it's amazing that uh, to talk with those students, how much it means to them, how articulate they can be. I mean, they're so much more articulate now than we ever thought about being, but they can articulate what that means to them. Um, there's a young lady over in the College of Education who was a recipient this past year of one of them, and uh, I mean, she's worked all her life, but she did. I mean, her parents divorced. She was really pretty much on her own from age 14 or 15. And prior to that, she was uh, taking care of the household, and, and she works here. And how much a scholarship means to her, I mean, it, 
It's one of those that uh, she can tell the story and there won't be a dry eye in the crowd, I'll tell you. Uh, because, I mean, it's just the way it is. Uh, so I, I think that's the main thing, is that uh, the foundation can, can raise funds. People can go away from the university with a, a really good feeling. Uh, those that go to school here, those that give money to the university, and hopefully those students, they will come back and do the same okay. thing. That they will, um, as life, you know, later in life, and some of them immediately out of school, uh, you, you, have given money back to the university. You mentioned They're given their time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the, the B word earlier, the billion, it's hard for me to even get it out. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about the uh, branding success campaign, the billion dollar campaign the university is engaged in now? Oh, it's, you know, it's a, uh, a great campaign. The money will be raised. Mm -hmm. um, I think so far, you know, a lot of fruit at the bottom of the tree has been picked. You know, you've got to work now, really work at it, and, and, and it'll happen. I think there'll be, um, you know, it's over the years, uh, the money will be raised. I think that there are people out there I think there are, are many Malone Mitchells out there that um, people haven't even approached. I mean, Malone Mitchell would tell you he was a hundred dollar a year guy, and he gave ended up giving a million shares of Sandridge stock. Great story, wonderful. Uh, I think there are people out there that uh, you know for. They just haven't been asked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a wonderful thing if you could say that people will just voluntarily step forward and say, let me give you X number of dollars. But human nature being what it is, uh, you've really got to make a case for it. I mean, you've got to tell that compelling story. Why? Why is it necessary? Mm -hmm. And you have to be very good stewards. You know, the, the, the money that is uh, being raised, that money that's going into scholarship, for example, or a professorship or whatever, but scholarship particularly, is, is being well managed and that the, uh, the money is being spent consistent with the donor's wishes. And speaking of that, how do you feel about the breakdown of the, the goals, for the, fund, the fundraising goals? You know, they've got like six hundred million for for scholarships, like two hundred million or so, two hundred fifty million for debt scholarships, and then about another hundred and fifty to two hundred million for facilities. Well, Does that make sense to you? Sure. Like that? I think you know it's much easier, I think, to raise money for scholarship mm -hmm. than it is for bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. Bricks and mortar, I think, that money will come from fewer people, but in larger amounts. I think more people many more people will give, and they will give smaller amounts to scholarship um, because they can relate to scholarship. I mean, I think you have to have to do a new business building, a new performing arts building, or work over at the HES building. No question, but those buildings are needed. But if it got right down to the end of the, the line and you said the money either goes into some kid getting a scholarship or there being a new building, chances are, I think, personal belief is the vast majority will go to scholarship. Uh, and, and nothing wrong with it. I mean, that's just, I think, the way it is. I think that, um, that uh, you have to have a very compelling reason. Why, uh, what's a compelling reason to have a new business building uh, when you have a building, first off? But you have to have a compelling story to tell somebody as to why you have to have a new building. Uh, you know, there, and, and certainly Boone Pickens has, has done so much for the university. Uh, Malone Mitchell. I mean, you go down the line of people who have been in positions where they've had substantial amounts of money and have come back and 
provided funding to the university. And you've, uh, you've also worked closely with the Spear School of Business and uh, many years with the Associates Group. You've chaired that group. Uh, what is the purpose of the Associates and, and, and what are well, some of its activities? Well, the uh, purpose of the business school certainly is to develop that relationship between uh, members and the university. It is to open doors. For example, right now with the new dean of the business school, I think the associates, uh, they provide input to the dean. They also provide uh, a method for the dean to get involved in the various communities. A subset of the business school, one I've been involved in, is the uh, accounting advisory board. Same thing, the accounting advisory board. When they had the, uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when they had that match in June of last year, as I recall, that there was $100 million that would be matched in uh, chairs and professorships, that right. Pickens was going to match it, right. and it would be matched also by the state, so you got a four-for-one deal. Right. The accounting advisory, and you only had 40 days to raise the money. And it had to be cash in the house. It, you know, wasn't pledges, cash money. The accounting advisory group raised for a, uh, a what was going to be a, a professorship, uh, raised four, over four hundred thousand dollars, and in forty days, cash money. Uh, it was four hundred and forty thousand dollars or something like that which then was matched by Pickens, which is then matched by the states, so that $450,000 all of a sudden becomes 1.8 at some point in time when uh, the matches are all taken care of, particularly with the state. And as you know, that's, that's when the state cut back on what they were going to match. But uh, those groups, um, like the accounting advisory group or the business associates together, because they've a lot of the accounting people are also on the business advice, or business group, but um, provides a way for, for example, uh, for Larry Crosby, the new dean, to meet people. You know, we, uh, from an accounting standpoint of the business school, have been with him to take him to a civic group, maybe the economic club of Oklahoma, to a variety of, of groups and introduce him there and get him involved because uh, that's part of, uh, not a part, but a big part of his, his position is, is the fundraising side. Uh, you know, historically that hasn't been true, but it is now. John, uh, speaking of uh, uh, Dr. Larry Crosby, how, how do you feel about his leadership as the new dean? Oh, you know, that's, uh, I met him. We talked two or three times on the phone before he came here. We talked once on a video conference, and then I had the opportunity to meet him a couple times. You know, been with him. Uh, we two weeks ago we were in Tulsa having lunch with a significant potential donor who's out of the business school that obviously he didn't know that I knew, and introducing to people like that. That uh, so. I think Larry it will bring a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I think uh, certainly from a business, true business standpoint, he's been involved. He's been out, you know, worried about a, uh, a payroll. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly he has an academic background. So probably fits fairly well with President Hargis because Hargis being a non-traditionalist, and I think you'd probably, in a lot of ways, you'd have to say that uh, that Crosby is a non-traditionalist. He isn't strictly the academic background. How do you feel about the uh, the new entrepreneurial program? Great program. In school. What do you? How do you view that? What well, kind of I think yeah, uh, we got involved uh, with a little funding and, and meeting with. Uh, they have the program. They bring in uh, military veterans that want to start a business and they provide them the wherewithal on an intense course of uh, study 
and then they, we were, went to the dinner of the graduation last year. It was very good. Uh, Bob Ham coordinates that, and uh, I think when you, you deal with the entrepreneurship, you're really talking about business. It's really, the business at, it, at its conception that uh, the entrepreneurs, the people that, that have that capability, um, you just look around and it, 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 the, what's happened with businesses. I mean, there are traditional businesses, there are people who are starting oil and gas companies, but they also then you have people who are out here starting in a, in a discipline that we don't know anything about. That, uh, and, and how do they do that? Well, you know, the basic courses in entrepreneurship help you out there. What you need to know. Why do businesses fail? A lot of them fail not because they can't make money. They fail because they don't have cash flow. They're making money, you know, but they don't have cash flow, so they fail. How do you preclude that? They teach you that over in the entrepreneurship program. And it's interdisciplinary. John, how did you respond to someone that said, well, you know, entrepreneurs are kind of born, not made kind of concept? How, no, how do you respond I to think that? that you have people that, uh, that have started businesses that, that uh, they took a chance. You have a lot of people who could start a business, who could have started the business, but didn't take the chance because they didn't feel like they had the wherewithal. Whether, whether it be financial backing or they didn't have the business acumen to run a business. Uh, it's like a lot of things, you know, that uh, what is it that, you know, you deal with innovation is, uh, you know, uh, necessity being the mother of innovation. There are a lot of things that will be done. I mean, there's things, innovators starting businesses every day. And, good number will fail and they'll fail for a variety of reasons and maybe through the entrepreneurship program would give people who lack the confidence to start a business to do it so I think it's a great thing for Oklahoma State I think it's a great thing for the business school I think it's uh, interdisciplinary and I think the kids from whether they be in the engineering school or the business school or the arts and science make any difference they ought to take a course in the entrepreneurship program. When you were talking about uh, accounting earlier, how do, you, how do you feel about the status of the accounting program in Oklahoma State now? I mean, of course, well, I think the accounting program at Oklahoma State, uh, I think, you know, back when I was in school, when Wilton Anderson came mm -hmm. and he taught only the elementary courses when he first came because he had been on the mm -hmm. AICPA board. Uh, after that, somewhere in the late 60s or 70s, that uh, the accounting program became a phenomenal program. It was recognized as one of the top ten accounting schools in the country. When our youngest son finished school in California, we had come to Oklahoma, and uh, we were talking about where he was going to go to college. And uh, His older brother went to the University of California in Santa Barbara beautiful school on the beach, wonderful place. And then he took potluck on a major. I mean, he picked a school and then figured, well, I'll study whatever they have. Whereas our daughter, I told her, you know, why don't you pick a major, we'll find a school. And she majored in special education and music at Texas Christian University. And so the youngest, he finished school in California high school. And uh, I said, you pick a major and we'll find a school. And uh, so he told me, and he said, I'm thinking about majoring in accounting. Cool. I said, I know where you're going to school. This was 1987. And uh, oh, and he knew I was going to say UCLA. He, he just knew it would be UCLA because I'd done some work with the people out there. And anyway, he, he just knew it. And uh, he said, great, yeah, I think accounting would be good. I said, yeah, you're going to Oklahoma State University. Oh my God! You know? <laughs> and here was somebody who had been in California for uh, from the time he was in the second grade through high school, <laughs> and uh, uh, because Oklahoma State, you know, had the name, great accounting school. 
And I think over the years, for a lot of reasons, things have happened and changed. And, and I think now, though, um, the, the group, as an example, four years ago, the accounting advisory group had maybe 30 members. They've got over 100 today. Um, the programs, like the CPA review course that they offer now, this past year on the exam, uh, the gold medal winner's highest score, two of the highest scores were OSU graduates. Um, I think they're doing more and more now in the School of Accounting, and certainly it has been, let me say the business school has been um, accredited, the School of Accounting has been accredited. It is done separately, but it's done at the same time. And I was fortunate enough, uh, Sarah asked me to, to attend a cocktail party when they finished Sarah the, Friedman. Sarah Friedman, Dean. when they finished the accreditation program, and I did. And uh, I will tell you that those people who performed the accreditation, they had great things to say about not only the business school but about the school of accounting, what they were doing there. And I think we have more and more people involved now in the uh, you know outside the School of Accounting that are providing assistance to the head of the School of Accounting um, advisory board. You know, a lot of these things that go on. Um, and, and bringing monetarily, bringing funding to the, uh, to the School of Accounting. Kind of looking back to college again, or the school, I guess it is now, properly, Spirit School of Business. Uh, you've been associated with several deans through the years. I mean, could you talk a little bit about the personalities and some of the deans and some of the strengths oh, they brought I, to, the, yeah. to the table? Uh, Sam Meyer. Actually, the first dean, I guess, I, when I was in school. Dick Poole. No, I think, I don't know if he was or not, but I think Gene Swearingen, Gene Swearingen. was there. Uh, but Bob Sam Meyer. Mm -hmm. and, and Bob uh, did a great job with the, the business school and the expansion and, and uh, the programs that, uh, that he initiated. Um, I mean, we could just talk forever about that. Uh, but then, um, then, you know, I was gone, so I don't know a lot of what happened when I wasn't here. I was trying to think who uh, You had one or two sort of short tenure, then you yeah. had Gary Trenopole was there. Well, several and years. Gary Trenopole is very capable, very, very capable individual. I was thinking of James Lumpkin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure James was a very good guy. I hosted a, a, a luncheon or something in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma City Golf and Country Club when he came and had a, you know, six or eight people there. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I never saw him again. He was, and maybe it was just different places, different time. I just never saw much of him uh, out in public, out in the communities. Uh, I think he was maybe you know spending more time from a deanship standpoint, I guess. But uh, Trenopole certainly very capable. Sarah, uh, very nice lady. Um, Did, a, as far as I could tell, but did a good job there. Seemingly worked well with the faculty. Um, and I think that uh, with Larry Crosby, I think he will do a very good job. John, you, you, we talked extensively about your long-term engagement with the accounting school, with the, the, the Spirit School of Business itself, and you know, with the university through the foundation. Kind of a question that comes to mind is, You've given unself, uh, really unselfishly of your time for many, many years. Why? I mean, well, you, I mean, where, where, you know, where's his passion come from? Well, okay. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? I answer. mean, if I can say that it was at Oklahoma State that I got an education, that I was able to uh, go out in the business world and make a living, that I met my wife here 50 years. Hell, that's reason enough. I mean, I mean, I can understand somebody that, 
you know, maybe say, I had a terrible experience at OSU, I failed or I flunked out or whatever happened to him. You know, I think Oklahoma State just provided the, um, the framework, everything else is up to the individual. I mean, they, they made it, uh, everything was accessible. It's kind of like, uh, do you know uh, Marilyn Middlebrook? Yes. Great lady, absolutely great lady. And, and what I would say about Marilyn over with the athletes, if an athlete doesn't graduate, it's the athlete's fault. She's done everything in the world for that athlete to graduate. Tony Abbott, one of her real success stories, that guy had about as much chance of, of graduating from college as I have of being an astronaut. About the same. And yet that guy did graduate. I mean, not only is a basketball player, he's playing professional basketball, but he graduated. Um, she taught of that. I mean, she should be, we should have that all over campus, not just for athletes. We should have a, a similar type environment for our students. We're talking about retention. That's how you retain students. I think, uh, I think that they say maybe 40% of the students uh, that drop out. And probably the vast majority of them would say, well, we drop out because of financial reasons. That's probably true in a lot of cases. But I think in a lot of cases, people drop out of school because they're not doing well at school. They, they haven't adjusted to the college life. They, they don't know how to study. Uh, all those things, this adjustment to a different group. And yet, over at her place, there. She, I, I can't say enough good things about her, what she does for those athletes academically. Because there are so few athletes that are going to make a living outside when they get out of, out of OSU. Yeah. I mean, it just isn't going to happen. You, you were there, hell. How many of the, the, of the guys, or women, that when you were here in school that made a living as a professional athlete? Small percentage. Small number. They, they're going to have to do something. And, uh, and and that's what she's able to do. And if we can do something similar to that in our various colleges, you know, it, it won't probably could not be on the same level of what she is able to do with the funding and everything that she has over there for the athletic group. But there is no reason why in the various colleges that we cannot establish a program that is somewhat on the same basis to help the kids that are on the borderline to help them uh, achieve success should be done i think by and large though and particularly i know when i was here there wasn't anything like that I mean, lord love it up you're just on your own you know you son you would either swim or sink and uh, and so i think if we talk about retention and want to get that retention up uh, one of the things we have to do, I believe, is uh, have that relationship with the students and, and really work with the students as far as not just in the classroom, but what happens outside the classroom. Because I don't know what the ratio is now, but it used to be, you know, you had three hours of work for every hour in the classroom. And, you know, some kids, they don't understand that. You know, they just, they, they just escapes them. That, uh, I'll go to class, and then they find out that they have failing grades. And I think you know, once that starts to happen, and, and you have grades that you realize that you probably aren't going to graduate, uh, then you have to ask yourself, well, why am I here? And why am I taking out a student loan, or why am I doing this stuff? Why? Maybe, or the parents look at it and say, hell, I'm not paying for your schools while you're getting <laughs> D's and F's. I'm not going to do it. And I think that's a big piece of it. And so when they say that they're dropping out because of financial reasons, I think you have to go a little deeper than that. I know that I would be the same if uh, one of my children while in school and, and they're bringing home D's and F's. I have to ask them the question or ask myself, what in the world am I paying for? Yeah. You know, it ain't going to happen. Well, expanding that concept of generating, how do you feel, John, about where the university is today and where in its future. Do you feel good about what's happening over Well, I think I feel good about what's happening with the university, certainly with the increased enrollment and what's going on. And, and um, it's everything about the university. It's, it's, you know, there's an awful lot of positive things going on. 
you know, you can talk about athletics. And I know people will say, well, why didn't you do this? Or why, you, you know, with pickings, you know, mm -hmm. academics or as opposed to athletics. But, you know, if you don't have, and you know it better than I do, if you do not have a somewhat quasi-successful football, football program, you don't have Title IX athletics, who's going to fund women's tennis and women's golf and men's golf and track and field? And we'll go down the whole list. Who funds that? It's got to come out of that athletic budget. And, you know, so where's the vast majority of the money has to come from football? And, you know, fortunately, right now, Oklahoma State's playing pretty good football. And, you know, there's funding, money is coming in. I don't think that's the panacea. I don't think that's the solve everything. But I think that the direction that the university is going is a very good direction. I do think that just like I think Hargis is correct when he says we need to focus on retention. We got to keep these kids in school. I don't know if it's factual. I do know when I was in school in the school of accounting, there's intermediate accounting. You had to pass intermediate accounting to get on, and that was make or break. If you couldn't pass intermediate accounting, you weren't going to be in the in accounting. You a marketing major or something? Well, you'll be something. Yeah. But but the same thing is true in engineering. Mm -hmm. You know, with those kids over engineering school, depending upon whether architecture or what phase of it was, that they had course like thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. They had strength in materials. Those were courses that were make or break courses. So if you look at a teaching, intermediate accounting, and you start out with a notion that I'm going to fail 40% of these kids because this is a tough course and I want it to be tough. So I'm going to fail 40% of the kids. You know, that's just a mission for failure. You know, instead of saying I'm going to fail 40% of the kids, we ought to be saying, what do I have to do to impart the knowledge to them to get a 100% pass ratio? That I'm not going to change, but I'm not going to start with the, the focus that this is the most difficult course in the world, and by God, there's 40% are going to fail. Um, I think it's just uh, you know, that, that, that we have to do everything at the university to help a kid succeed. It'd be great if 100% would, uh, that start the university would complete it. Be wonderful. Is it uh, possible? Yes. Is it probable? No. But it sure as hell ought to be better than sixty percent. And so, anything that we can do as a university to help these help the kids get through, we should be doing. You've mentioned uh, President Hargis, Burns Hargis, several times. How do you feel about his leadership at the university? Oh, I guess I've known Burns Hargis since I came to Oklahoma City in nineteen eighty-five. Mm -hmm. So. The only advice that somebody asked me from the foundation, they said, well, what do you think about Burns Hargis being president? This is before he was named. And I said, well, the only thing I can tell you is that, that if he is named president, you guys better be ready to go 24-7 because that's the way he is. He's just one of those people that's just 24-7. Uh, is he going to have all the right answers? No. Is he going to shoot himself in the foot periodically? Yes. But I think he brings a uh, a different perspective. I think he brings some real life into the university, uh, and, and not just that he's uh, you know uh, stand-up comic. I mean, he's got all the one-liners in the world. But I think he really wants to make it a much better place. I think uh, he's not satisfied with the status quo. It would have been easy on this campaign to make it a $500 million campaign. You know, um, at Getty and then at Kerr-McGee, I always had everybody in the my area anyway, always had performance objectives. We always had an objective. And uh, I can remember when I came to uh, 
think it was it came to Kermagee and we instituted that and we had performance objectives and somebody said one of the groups um, operating areas said well I achieved a, you know at the end of the year we have to go through mm -hmm. and achieved 140 percent of my objectives <laughs> here I had already done mine and we had achieved like 92 percent this guy had 140 percent and Jerry McKinney looked over at me and he said, John, what do you think about that? That uh, you know, they achieved 140%, you achieved 92%. What do you think about that? I said, I don't think they had very good performance objectives. <laughs> they didn't write them very well. <laughs> I said, to me, you know, they kind of looked at me like I was an idiot, but I said, you know, to me, a performance objective is something you have to reach for. It's, it's just beyond your reach. It's something that you have to work for. That it's not something that when you agree with your boss of this is a performance objective is something that's easily obtained. And I think that's what Hargis looks at. I think he's looking out there, if you're talking about getting a much higher retention rate, if you're talking about uh, what's going to happen here, a billion dollar campaign, it'd been easy to make it 750, it'd been easy to make it 500 been a slam dunk. But he stepped out and said, let's make it a million. So we'll get there. So where were we? Tell me, uh, President Burns Hargis and his leadership. Well, as I said, I think Willing Burns, to risk and stretch and reach out. I think you have to, if you're going to have an objective, then you have to reach out. It's kind of like, a, you know, um, some ways it's like with rules. You have rules. If you don't enforce the rules, you don't have a rule. If you have a performance objective and you don't have to reach for it, it's not much of an objective. I think you know you, you have to do that. I think he stepped out with a billion dollar campaign. I think uh, requiring the deans to be fundraisers, I think um, that's probably unheard of per se. I mean, there's probably many universities where they have this, um, maybe not throughout the university, but various schools within the university or various colleges within the university but I think he's making that a you know, um, I haven't seen them haven't heard about them don't know what they are but I'm sure that in his view when he looks at the various deans part of their accountability is going to be what kind of fundraisers are they that they're going to have to be out there on the front line and raise the money and I think they're there are some people that could be a wonderful, wonderful dean academically, but they don't want to do that. I mean, that's just not their thing. And uh, so I think you're going to see more and more you know, non-traditional that people are going to come into, the, at least wise for the time being. And it may change later on, but I think for the time being, you're going to see the deans involved in the, in the fundraising. And I think that's where a lot of the, the foundation comes in play, that the foundation works with the deans to the extent that the deans don't really understand or don't or are not comfortable fundraising, that the foundation helps them with that, that through their individual development officers that the, uh, where they get the deans out. Uh, I know Larry uh, Crosby told me that he would be spending 40% of his time on fundraising but he's going to spend two days a week, I said 40, he said two days a week, he will be out meeting people, fundraising. Uh, will he be successful? We hope so. But it, it, it'll, like everything else, uh, you, know, you have to develop relationships. By and large, um, I would imagine that the, any relationship, you know, it takes a while to mature and until uh, somebody is going to be comfortable enough and uh, be in a position that they can be comfortable that the university is going to take their funds and do with them what they want done, that they're going to be able to comply with the donor's wishes, whatever they happen to be. In a lot of cases, the donor doesn't know what his wishes are. Mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about this compelling story, that's where you get over to where try to get the donor in line with that compelling story. And it may not be. It may be that uh, 
somebody is telling a compelling story for a business building and really the individual's real passion is someplace else. That may be in the performing arts and would rather do something because he and this individual and his wife participate or attend everything in the performing arts and they got a pretty sorry facility. So you say, well, yeah, that's a great story you're telling me about the business school, but really my, my emphasis would be over in performing arts or something. So I think we have to be able to align the donors' um, wishes with the needs of the university, because there are plenty of needs to go around. John, you've, uh, and you'd be the last to acknowledge this, but, but I'll say it for you, okay? <coughs> you've received special recognition and awards from Oklahoma State University. Uh, can you share some of them that have been especially meaningful to you? Oh, I think any award is meaningful, uh, regardless of what it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're somebody who recognizes you for what you've done in the uh, accounting profession or what you've done in the finance profession, what you've done just, you know, relative to the university, whether it be uh, as an uh, alumnus, that uh, you've done something. Certainly they're, they're all meaningful. But the, uh, I try to attend everyone with you know, distinguished graduates and um, where another people are being initiated or coming into the group, try to attend those because you know, there, there's some common bonding there. If somebody somewhere is recognizing you for something you've done. Bottom line is um, we talked a little bit earlier about this chain of command, so to speak, that you can supervise effectively five to eight people, and that's about all you can effectively supervise. That if I didn't have some very, very capable people that were part of that five to seven, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, sometimes I would wonder about that somebody who reported to me that I would say, to myself, they ought to be in this chair. You know, they are such outstanding individuals, and many of them have gone on to do some great things. But uh, it's it's very very little about the individual. It's more about uh, the we concept. Uh, you know, it's uh, John. Let me let me let me step in for you again, okay? Yeah. All right, let, let me read off, and you can you can you can smile. OSU Alumni Hall of Fame, which is the highest distinction that the university gives to, to an alumnus, uh, the Spear School of Business Hall of Fame, uh, the OSU Distinguished Alumnus Award. And certainly part of it was because of your success as a professional, mm -hmm. part of the, the uh, measurements of those, uh, those recognitions, if you will, is what you've done for Oklahoma State University. And that, that speaks to, to over the years, your relationship, your connections for life with the university. How, how do you feel about that? Well, it's a great feeling, certainly. Um, it's um, not only within an individual but within a family because mm -hmm. the family all participates in whatever the award happens mm -hmm. to be. But it is. It, it's great to be recognized by whatever group it is. Great to be recognized by your university. It's great to be recognized. But again, it's a, uh, there's a lot of people out there that could be recognized. And, and so to say that uh, one individual is recognized as opposed to somebody else, you know, somebody made a call on it. And uh, not that people aren't deserving. There's a lot of people deserving. And, and so I look at it and say, hey, I accept this, but I recognize that, that um, there's an awful lot of people involved. Uh, I think in a lot of ways with OSU, I'm sure Frank McPherson pushed me to do things with OSU. Frank McPherson pushed me to do the Boys and Girls Club because he had been involved in the Boys and Girls Club and he was moving on to something else. So I think there's always, you look around, there are people there that uh, have motivated you. Uh, probably with the Boys and Girls Club, it was equally with my wife who's involved with children. Always involved with children. And uh, she could tell you stories that just would absolutely uh, break your heart with kids and what she has seen and what she's been able to do. But uh, I think any time you acknowledge somebody, you're acknowledging not only them, but 
a lot of people around them that have helped them to where they are today. Uh, we didn't get here by ourselves. John, final question. It's a serious question, okay? <laughs> but, I mean, looking back, how do you hope people remember John Lenahan? Oh, in a word, honorable. That's all. If somebody can, you know, say, well, he was an honorable individual. You know, I think that goes a long way. Um, a good individual, we talked about, you know, C.S. Lewis. Uh, I think you can say he was good, a good individual. If people who I worked with would say, he was good to work with, I enjoyed working with him. I think that makes all the difference in the world. Um, but you say, you know, a person of integrity, a person of, you know, kind of honorable to me, kind of encapsulates an awful lot of things that you can talk about a person that is honorable and uh, be there. That's um, the way I do it. John, have we left anything out? What have we missed? Oh, no, I, I could tell you all kind of good stories, but anyway. <laughs> we've got most of them. Uh, as I say, it's, it's been a great road. It's uh, been a lot of fun, met a lot of wonderful people, and, and by and large, um, I'm 71 years old, you know, and I don't do a whole lot of things unless I really have a passion for it or I really enjoy it. So, uh, you know, go Pokes. Thanks. Appreciate it, John. Sure.